Okay, well, hello everyone. Um, my name is Paula Lightfoot. I'm an Earth Observation Specialist at JNCC and um, I just wanted to say <clears throat> a quick few words before we get started um, and I'll hand over to Ian. Um, so I wanted to welcome you all to these training sessions on understanding and using radar data. Um, this has proved really popular. We're absolutely delighted by the level of interest we've had. Um, and I just wanted to say thank you to Professor Ian Woodhouse from Edinburgh University, who's running these training sessions for us. Um, Ian has got a huge amount of experience and expertise um, both in teaching and research and using radar data for many applications, I think with a particular interest in forestry. Um, and he also wrote the excellent textbook, Introduction to Microwave Remote Sensing, um, which we have got a link to that on our website. And if you want um, a copy or any more information, we can provide information about that during the course. Um, I'd like to thank our funders, the Caroline Herschel Framework Partnership Agreement on Copernicus user uptake, because they're the ones that made these training sessions possible. Um, this is part of a whole suite of projects going on at JNCC at the moment, um, all with the aim of increasing the use of Copernicus data and products for public sector environmental applications. Um, also wanted to mention we've got some guest speakers coming up, not today, but in the future sessions, and they'll be giving brief talks on how their organisations are using radar data. So um, I just want to say thank you in advance to them for doing that. We've got um, Crispin Hambidge from the Environment Agency, Helena Sykes from Natural Resources Wales, and Katie McPherson from the Marine Management Organisation. So thanks in advance to them. A um, couple of housekeeping points. Um, as I said in my email, we are going, we are recording these sessions now and we're going to make edited parts of it available, so just the lectures, and we won't be sharing participant names or personal details. Um, so we'd just like to ask you to keep your webcams off and your microphones muted during the lectures to avoid any distractions and then we can switch on again for questions and discussion. Um, if you've got questions you want to ask, you can use the chat forum. I'll be monitoring that. Um, <clears throat> and a final point I just wanted to make, um, we have got a newly launched um, Slack workspace. It's a discussion forum for people using Sentinel-1 and 2 um, analysis ready data. And I was thinking it could be good to use this to chat about any radar data topics that come up during this course or any of the um, data analysis that we're doing. So I will post a link in the chat about that sometime during the session. Um, any of you who are public sector environmental organisations, you're pre-approved to join, so it should be okay. Um, anyone else, just you'll need an invitation, so just drop me a message and I'll invite you as well. Um, okay, so I think that's everything I wanted to cover. If I think of anything else, I'll pop up at the end. Otherwise, I will um, hand over to Ian to start telling us about um, SAR data. Thank you, Ian. Great, thank you very much, Paul, for that introduction. Um, and thank you and GNCC for inviting me to, to come and give these uh, short lecture courses on, um, on radar remote sensing. So it is very much introducing synthetic aperture radar. We've got um, two sessions this week, two sessions next week. Um, so it is quite compressed. Um, I'll, I will try to pick out some of the, the feedback and the, um, that we asked you to give in terms of the topics that you're interested in to try to pick up on, on some of them. But just quickly, in terms of um, sort of the rules rules of the game, uh, those of you who haven't been on Zoom before, you should be able to find the the hand up um, button on the uh, when you look at the participants list, or if the question comes to you when I'm when I'm talking, you can put it into the chat, and we'll we'll either catch up with that when when I come to a natural break, or if it's something that looks urgent, um, Paula will keep an eye on it and, and she'll interrupt. Uh, the I don't mind um, people contacting me, dropping me an email if you've got other questions. Um, I can't promise to answer everything, but I can probably point you in the right direction to, to find something. And the, the key thing is, yeah, I can't always um, pay attention to, to hands going up and everything else. So I'm, I'll be relying on Paula to, to sort of keep an eye out for that or, or questions in the chat. Also, if I if I keep looking off to the side, that's because I've got two two monitors here. So it's not me ignoring you or, or checking my emails. It's it's just because I'm I'm some either the Zoom information for uh, all you participants, or I'm looking at the, uh, the my next slide. So in terms of uh, uh, a quick outline of what we're going to cover. And the point at the, below, at the bottom there, I'll start off with that just because Paula mentioned it, is that we are recording these sessions. Um, we won't be uh, showing anybody that's participating. It will just be the, um, the speakers and the question and answer sessions we'll do, we'll, we'll cut them out. And also some of the, the practical work, which we'll, we'll look a bit less 
interesting in the, as a video content. The other thing to note is that uh, these topics, um, I'll put in my excuses now, is that, that Zoom is still, is still uh, relatively new to me in terms of, of giving lecture courses. And what I found in the, this, the ones that I have done to date is that the timing doesn't always go the same as I expect in a, in a stand-up live, live lecture. Some of the things and the questions and answers can sometimes take a bit longer. And there's also a, a time in terms of the, uh, the, the technical elements of, of passing between things. And we found just, you know, admitting people th um, this afternoon takes a couple more minutes than you expect. So, so forgive me if I if some of these things slip. So, so some things might move on to other sections or be brought forward just depending on the timing. But we will get through all of the topics in the four days, just not necessarily in the exact order that it's presented there. We've got roughly uh, a two-hour session, uh, but in days two, three, and four, there will also be uh, some guest speakers, as Paula mentioned. And what I'll be doing on, on day four, it's called a practical, but we will be doing um, a couple of things. And I realize that there's, there's quite a spread of, um, of background and expertise in remote sensing. Some of you have very little uh, background in remote sensing at all. Some of you know remote sensing very well, but don't know radar. And some of you are quite advanced in, in remote sensing and, and radar. So, so what we've decided to do is kind of split it slightly in that uh, we're going to look at um, SNAP in one section. So those of you who feel comfortable actually getting your hands onto some data, we'll look at SNAP. Uh, for those of you less, um, uh, less confident about handling data and want to just explore some data very quickly, we'll look at the EO browser. Or um, what I'm probably going to do is get you onto EarthBlocks. I just need to make sure I can register you all in that. So EarthBlocks is a, is a brand new tool, which is uh, not widely available yet, but it's a, a great opportunity to uh, access data very quickly. And we can, we can use that to look at some examples. You can decide which group you end up in by the end of day three. And in fact, you may decide that um, the practical work that I will give you for SNAP is actually something you could do in your own time. So you could take that away and do in your own time and just join the uh, essentially the plenary group of, of looking at some, some data and, and talking about that. I thought I should just quickly say who I am. Um, so it's, it's always think relevant and important that, that, that I justify to some extent why I'm here and um, giving, you know, doing most of the speaking. And I'm also quite, uh, quite happy to, to share the fact that I'm, you know, I do a lot of radar and I do a lot of um, teaching in radar. But there are a lot of a lot of people I know that are far better and far no, more knowledgeable about radar than I am. It's a it's a topic which can consume your entire lifetime career, and um, and there's many people that are far better at using and doing things with radar than I am. I hope that what I can do is bring some interesting perspective and a way of looking at radar that will um, that you'll find interesting. Uh, you'll find informative if it's the first time that you've come across radar. Uh, but you'll find it interesting as maybe as a perspective and a way of looking at it or some of the, the graphics that I might use, you, you might find helpful in looking at radar in a different way. What I can do, I mentioned that um, the fact that I, I know other people that are very good at radar is that you might have questions for me that I can't answer, um, but what I will try to do is make sure that I point you in the direction of somebody who can answer that question. And part of that is because I'm a professor of applied earth observation at the University of Edinburgh. There are colleagues at Edinburgh who are experts at doing particular things and analyzing and using particular bits of software for, for looking at radar remote sensing. Um, and I will, th th that would be my first port of call, but there are other people around the world that are, are very good at, um, that are bound to be able to answer all of the questions that you might have. Um, I have, these days, I, I spend a lot of time doing doing other things rather than research. So I'm the chair of the UK Space Agency's Earth Observation Advisory Board, for example, uh, and I'm also involved in a couple of startup um, companies. Some of them are quite well developed now. So CarboMap, we've been running for seven years. Um, EarthBlocks, twelve months. Um, and Ecometrica, in fact, for over ten years now. That's been that's been running. I'm also going to give you the link to the uh, ESA SAR MOOC, so run by the University of Jena in Germany um, in their SAR EDU program. I'll give you that link in a second um, because that's a really fantastic resource. If, if, you're, if you find you want to dig a little bit deeper 
but not not go too far in terms of remote sensing, that's a great place to to start. There's lots of video content, and there is uh, there's other other work in there that will give you a good grounding in a wide range of SAR applications. And just to mention, I have I've got some firsthand experience of actually trying to look at how to use radar remote sensing in a actual a practical environment. So projects for for ESA and the Scottish government and the space applications catapult, and then also more recently on the IPP projects, international partnership projects run by the UK Space Agency. Um, but a lot of the work I do is actually is is based in Malawi, where radar has some has real potential advantages there. But Edinburgh, so this is. Um, I'm not quite, I'm, I'm away off in the distance in the far right hand side on the horizon is where I'm physically based just now. So I'm, I'm at home. Uh, this looks like some library with the books behind the real actual books, but I'm, um, it's actually really just an extended shoe cupboard. But this is, this is where I am. And I realize that everybody else is unusual in, in different places and at home and in bedrooms and in cupboards and, and one or two of you might even be into the office. Um, but one of these days, I hope, I hope when, uh, when things are easier, um, you'll come and visit Edinburgh, and and certainly we have we we have master's programs and uh, and teaching programs that are uh, cover a wide range of Earth observation and GIS uh, activities. Now these are a couple of links. What I'll do at the end of the the session when we finish the the recording is I'll just copy and paste these links into um, into the chat, and then you'll get them straight away. But the the book that uh, Paula mentioned, uh, you can get an ebook. There's an ebook version that is a PDF replica rather than a real ebook. Uh, it's in Kindle format, and that's the link that I've, I've given you there. You'll find that there's the full ebook that's published by the uh, publishers, which is significantly more expensive. So, um, so just be aware of the, of the the difference there. Intro to radar.com. I essentially created that website to. Um, to, to show off some animations of the book, the pictures that are in the book. One of the key things that I will talk about today is that uh, radar remote sensing is all about the, the time domain. It's all about the time dimension. And, and it makes it really difficult to, to then learn about radar remote sensing if you've got static pictures. So I've got quite a lot of animations that I use in these lectures, but also if you go to intro to radar.com, you will find that there are some other animations in there. And many of the animations I'll show you, in fact, are on that um, website. And that's, a, um, I think, is a, an important resource for understanding the, the significance of time in the way that radar works. Echoes in Space is the, is the MOOC, which I encourage you to, to, to go towards. And the Sentinel Hub at the bottom here, that's if you're going to do the SNAP practical next week, uh, you have to sign in and register for the Sentinel Hub. So follow that link and become a, a user. It's a non-commercial user. You're learning. You're doing it for us for um, learning purposes. So it doesn't cost anything. You should be able to sign into that. <clears throat> so today, what I'm, what I'm doing today is the is the history, some of the fundamentals, uh, talking about the properties of waves, and the this is my first animation. This is the, the key thing. If you take nothing away from the, the lectures that I'm presenting to you these, over these two weeks, this is the one graphic that I want to just have you stick in your head. And let me just make sure that um, the graphic makes sense in the first place. So up here at the top is our antenna. And it's on a satellite or an aircraft. And what I want you to imagine is that we're, we're, you're flying into the board. So the direction of travel is, is into the screen. So perpendicular to the screen and we're, we're looking side on. So the point directly below the satellite is down here. That's your, your standard nadir. So if you're an optical system, you're looking straight down with a camera and you're looking at the ground down here. This dark area down the bottom, this is our ground surface. And what we're going to do with the, um, a radar system is that, unlike an optical system, we're, what we're going to do is we're going to look obliquely. And if you send out a radar signal obliquely, the echoes coming back from targets along the ground 
record a signal that is approximately in proportion to the distance along the ground. So this axis of time at the top here, that's the raw measurement that the radar is going to measure. It's just measuring the time delay of the echoes coming back. But that time is approximately in proportion to the distance along the ground. There's an angle we have to take into account here, and we're making a big assumption about the ground being flat. And we're, that's these are some of the things that we're going to look at over the next couple of weeks. So this is this is the important diagram. And if I'm going to stop it, whoops, try and stop it midway. Is that in this system when the signal starts to come back? It's a, there's lots of things that we have to have to consider here in terms of what we're what we're going to look at over the next couple of weeks. And the way I've kind of broken it down is to is that day one today we're kind of looking at the context and the and these electromagnetic waves. So these orange beams that are getting sent out and bounced off the ground. What's what what properties do they have? How do we describe them? Um, what do they look like? What happens when they combine together? What form do they take? How do we do, how do we record them? So that's what we're going to do today. Today, uh, today two and Wednesday is we're going to look at the, the the point on the ground, which is well, what influences the scattering at ground level? So what is it that determines how much energy is scattered from these targets on the ground, and which which direction do they scatter? And then on day three, we are going to look at the system and the, the, the signals. So look in a little bit more detail about what is it we're measuring and what's the consequences of some of these assumptions. So a very key assumption is going to be looking at the, this assumption of the ground surface being flat. The ground surface on Earth isn't flat, it has topography. So what happens when we introduce topography into our measurement? How, do, how does that impact on the, on the radar image? And that's one of the major distortions that we have in our, uh, our, our radar image is due to the mismatch between our assumption of the ground being flat, but, the, but that assumption being wrong. So that's essentially how it was broken down. So this, this little animation is our uh, representative of the, of the structure of the course. And day, day four is, the, is looking at actual, a bit more practical things, looking at actual data, seeing how it changes over time, what is, what does it look like if you manipulate the data in different ways? And one of the things, if we just look at an image of, uh, this is Guadeloupe in, um, in the Caribbean. And the image on the left is the kind of data that you'll see if you start working with SNAP and actually downloading your own data and looking at it. Um, you'll notice that the, the, the picture on the left and the picture on the right, it's the same island, but the one on the left is stretched out, so it's not geographically correct, and it's also flipped north to south. So north is to the bottom instead of to the top, and, it's, and the proportions are different. And the reason for this is that when you start looking at the raw radar imagery, uh, what you find is that the pixels aren't square, they're rectangular. And the coordinate system is based on the radar system. It's not based on the geographic coordinates. So what we'll find is that the that very often get uh, your data looks upside down and uh, and proportionally wrong. You'll also see that these mountains on the on the left here, if I just identify them, is that they they look like they are uh, almost like they're leaning over. And so this is part of the the distortion because of the assumption of the, the flat ground underneath. And what we really want to do is get to a point, you'll notice that on the, the image, it's been, it's been corrected. So the image on the right, each of those, each of the pixels is now in its proper geographic location. And that's the, that's more, that's nearer to the analysis ready data format that, that, that most of us really want to deal with. So most of us kind of want to ignore what's going on over here. And we want to just stick to the, uh, analysis ready data type format. Pixel is in its right location and is uh, geographically correct. Now I'm going to, I think it's important and some of the things that I'm going to talk about over the, the next couple of weeks 
is about what happens over um, in this process going from the left to right here. And that's important because if you want to understand the kinds of errors, the problems, the issues that are um, the, the weird things that turn up in your analysis ready data image, if you know where it came from, you'll you'll be in a better position to make judgments on the quality and the, the reason for some of the, the weird things that you might see in the data. So many of you, a few of you, when, um, when you do the SNAP practical, will actually learn how to do this um, process. For the majority of, um, of you, I think what you're interested just to know is what are the steps that have to be gone through to get from the left to the right? so that you can make better judgments and interpretation of the analysis ready data. And that's that's essentially what my my ambition is over the next couple of weeks is to give you that at least even if you can't actually do it yourself, at least have enough knowledge to realize where it's coming from. And one of the one of the steps that we have to really understand is that each pixel in our uh, in our radar image is is capturing the actual wave. So I've got I've got my set of waves here. So if you can see my my the picture of me and my my video cam, is that that's a wave that's almost about the the to scale um, the size of a wave that the Sentinel One radar system uses. Okay, so it's it's about that kind of um, scale in terms of wavelength, the amplitude. Um, we it's difficult to to visualize what that would be in, but in terms of wavelength. And in each pixel, what we're actually measuring is the individual waves. So not just the, the amplitude or the energy of that wave, but we're also uh, determining where that wave is in its wave cycle. So if we have two waves like this, our radar system is going to be able to tell the difference if there's a little shift in the, in the phase. So the, the stage that the wave is at, we're also going to measure that. And what that means is that each pixel actually has two numbers. And we'll see a bit later that, that sometimes we can represent those as a um, an amplitude and a phase, and sometimes we'll represent it as two numbers, almost like Cartesian coordinates. But we do have an amplitude and phase, so we've got two numbers for every pixel in a, a radar image. And one of the ways that I, that I often structure, if I'm doing a longer set of training, is to differentiate between uh, the amplitude and the phase, because a lot of the time, if you're looking at analysis ready data, you're only really interested in amplitude. Often you've only got access to the amplitude data. That tells you about the intensity of the signal or the, or the backscatter, but it doesn't, um, you might never look at the, the phase information. And the phase information comes into its own when you start to look at things like interferometry. So radar interferometry is quite a powerful tool that is, exploits the fact that we can measure that phase. Understanding a little bit about these waves and how they combine, though, is it's one of the ways we can also start to understand speckle. And speckle is one of the, the features that uh, puts off a lot of people, I find, is that you, you maybe spend a long time looking at Landsat and Sentinel-2 data, and then somebody tells you, oh, I've got some radar data and it's got a 12 meter resolution. The, the problem with that definition is that the resolution is, is based on point targets. So the spatial resolution is based on the separation of point targets. And you don't get speckle on point targets. For most of, by the looks of the, the answers that you gave, uh, most of the topics that you're all interested in are, are more to do with distributed targets. I think one person was interested in ships, which is the nearest thing you might get to point targets. But most of us are more interested in the in distributed targets, so agricultural fields, areas of forest, um, features that are much larger than the size of a pixel. And when somebody first is introduced to a radar image <clears throat> and told the spatial resolution, they expect something that looks similar to an optical image of the same spatial resolution. And it doesn't because it has this noise-like feature of speckle. Now, technically speckle is, is not noise. You can, we can elaborate on that if somebody wants to question me about it, but speckle is not noise. It just has noise-like properties. And if you have one image, uh, that's problematic. If you have multiple images, you can potentially start to extract some useful information. And one of the things that we'll actually look at next week in the practical session is we will we will look at the um, the, the methods or, or 
uh, tools that can help to reduce the speckle so that you get something that looks that's a, a bit easier to deal with. Right, so I'm going to give you um, what I said was in the first session is I'm going to give you a little bit of a history of, of radar. And I think that's important. What I've said here is changing your incorrect understanding of the history of remote sensing. Uh, that's my provocative statement um, based on the fact that of, well, it's based on looking at many introductory remote sensing textbooks and having gone to some lectures as a student about introducing remote sensing. And the, the challenge there is that they, they always cover the same topics. There's always very focused on, uh, uh, on the development of the camera photographic film into optical scanners. And in fact, none of that might ever have been developed and it would have had no impact whatsoever on the history of radar remote sensing. So radar remote sensing is entirely different. It has no heritage in cameras. It has no heritage in, in the development of photographic film. So what I'm going to start with is the, is the history, and then what I'm going to lead that on to, because I want to get your head in the right place for the, for the history. I'm going to lead that into looking at the fundamentals of what a wave is and how we quantify it, how we record it, how we describe it. Uh, I want to introduce you to the idea of polarization, and I've got, um, I've got some little polarized filters here that I'm going to show you a couple of things um, just to get you thinking about polarization. I'm going to touch a little bit on the combination of waves, so the um, what's called interference, so what happens when multiple waves combine. And if we've got some time, this might shift on to Wednesday um, at the rate I'm going, is that there's some core principles that I want you to make sure that you're very comfortable with, so decibels, complex numbers, radians. Not because you necessarily have to go away and use all these, but you will come across them, you'll come across them in the literature, you'll come across them in software that ask you options and it's important that you've, you've got at least some basic understanding of, of these topics. So in terms of a history, now it's not a real history. This is my history. Uh, it's incredibly biased towards um, people with Scottish heritage, you'll notice. And that's, that's partly my biases, uh, partly because there is an awful lot of um, Scottish connected people that are in the history of radar for some reason, uh, although many of them went off and, and did their work outside of Scotland. Um, and I think it's important that you get your head into the into understanding where radar comes from because and it, if you the more you think about radar as being like a camera or um, the the less likely you are to really understand what's happening in a radar system. So there's no, so Nadar as a photographer, completely irrelevant. Uh, pigeons with cameras, another classic one that turns up in, in remote sensing books, completely irrelevant. Flash photography is often given as, a, as an, an analog for radar remote sensing. But again, that is completely wrong. And in fact, will, will make you even more confused if you're, it's an, you might argue it's an active form of remote sensing, but it is not anything like uh, radar remote sensing. In actual fact, your history, um, this device here, my mobile phone, the development of, of telephones and mobile phones in particular has much more in common in the with the development of radar. Now, a key thing here, just to make sure that we're all on the same page, is that this is the electromagnetic spectrum. Um, at the turn of the 18th century, there was some understanding both of the visible part of the spectrum, the red, orange, yellow, green, blue, indigo, violet, uh, and recognition that there was something, some of, of the light existed beyond the red, so the infrared, and also beyond the violet, so the ultraviolet. So there was increasing awareness of the fact that, that light extended beyond that. But down this range here was, was completely unknown about at the beginning of the 19th century. And that's the zone that we're that we're going to look at. Now, one of the key things about being down at that part of the electromagnetic spectrum is that clouds have no impact whatsoever. 
it's one of the things that are that is often cited as being a key advantage of synthetic aperture radar. I, I would argue that it's it is an advantage, but it's not the key advantage. The key advantage is you're making measurements uh, that are on a completely different scale. You're making measurements that are sensitive to uh, properties of objects that are on this kind of scale. So it, you're making a different measurement. It's a bonus and an extra feature that we can see through the clouds and therefore we're guaranteed as soon as a radar system turns on its, uh, its radar imager, we are guaranteed to get an image. And that's, that's potentially, ad well, it is very advantageous and it's why the Sentinel-1 system is able to collect essentially global data every, within every couple of weeks. The reason for that is because if you look at the transmission through the atmosphere, so this is, um, well, this is absorption through the atmosphere. So when this graph gets high, the electromagnetic radiation is absorbed. When it's low, uh, it's transparent. And so these two areas here in the visible part of the spectrum and over into the microwave part of the spectrum, these are the two major windows where the atmosphere had the, has the least impact. And the other advantage for us is that the that clouds also, they impact drop significantly significantly so in the microwave domain we have got a clear transmission through the atmosphere and through clouds heavy rain has a little bit more impact um, but in terms of cloud cover it's generally uh, it, it's not a problem now the key thing in terms of the electromagnetic spectrum is that Nobody had, um, although Faraday in the middle of the 19th century was doing experiments that identified this strange wave. So what Faraday was doing is that in his lab in the basement of the Royal Society in Edinburgh, uh, Edinburgh in London, Royal Society in London, is that, uh, is that he put an electric, oscillating electric current through a wire in one end of his lab. So that current was going back and forth, back and forth. And what you find was that if you put a wire in the other end of the laboratory, that would actually respond and generate a current as well. So the electrons seem to move. If you move the electrons in the wire over on the left here, is that somehow, and what he thought of as that electric field traveling as a wave would stimulate the electrons in that, that other piece of wire. So you had a way of transmitting these, these strange electric fields from one location to another location. It was James Clark Maxwell that, that took Faraday's experiments and managed to put them together into a theoretical explanation for what was happening. Um, and it was Maxwell that, that made the, the leap to say that, well, these waves that we're measuring, which are on a scale of centimeters to meters in wavelength, they're just the same as, if I, if I go to that slide, uh, all of these things are just the same phenomena. They're all electromagnetic waves they're just at different wavelengths. So being able to link that optical part of the, the visible part of the spectrum and the microwave part of the spectrum and saying they're just the same thing. It's just slightly varying properties such as the frequency and wavelength, but essentially it's the same phenomena. And that was a huge leap in terms of our understanding of the um, electromagnetic radiation. And then the key thing was also this um, through Faraday and Maxwell's work is, is characterizing it as a wave. And we'll look a bit later in terms of how we characterize that wave. And the fact that the, if you've got a, uh, a transverse wave like this, is that, so that's, that's a wave like your, if you've got a long rope, a long, long skipping rope and you start putting a wave into it, that's the longitudinal, uh, a transverse wave, which you can oscillate up and down, or you can oscillate side to side. And so you can have waves that are like this, or we can have waves that are like that. And that's the difference between vertical and horizontal polarization. So we'll look at that a little bit later also. Now these particular waves and the waves across the electromagnetic spectrum, <coughs> uh, they all have a velocity of about three times 10 to the eight meters per second. We use lowercase c to represent the, the speed of light. Uh, the speed of light is constant in a vacuum, but as it goes through a medium, it might slow down a little bit. For imaging radar, that's not significant, but in other types of radar like altimeters, it actually it slows it down sufficiently that you have to take that into account to make your um, measurements. The wavelengths that we're looking at is on a scale of millimeters to meters. 
but it's also important just to note the, the frequency range that we're, we're in here. So that's about hundreds of megahertz to tens of gigahertz. And the, uh, one of the, the interesting things to note here is that the radar people are very keen on, on using things that are much more related to, to time. So you'll, you'll notice that in the radar literature and radar people will often talk about the frequency of the wave rather than the wavelength. I try to mix between the two because, because if you're interested in what happens at the target, it's easier to think about the, the scale of the, the wavelength, so the, um, the scale of the wave, so the wavelength, in terms of how it interacts with the target. Whereas engine, uh, radar engineers and radar scientists, because they're always thinking in the time domain, I think that's the reason why they always like to talk about uh, the frequency. So they are talking about the um, five gigahertz for the Sentinel one, and they'll talk about hundreds of megahertz as the bandwidth, and the because uh, time is inherent in that. Whereas a wavelength is a static measure, so time isn't inherent in that. And one of the other properties is this idea of phase. So the technical term in terms of phase, we're going to look at a, um, some nice graphics to help understand that. But phase is the difference between those two waves. As I move, the both these waves have both got the same wavelength, they've both got the same amplitude. But if I move them like that, they have a slightly different phase. So the stage they're at in their wave cycle is different. That's what the phase relates to. Now, another important um, figure, and this is a this is always an interesting one. Put your let's let's get some audience participation here. So, if you go down to the the section with the um, I can't remember what it's called now, but the sort of emotive responses, I'm going to ask you three three places where Alexander Graham Bell came from, and put your put your thumb up if you ag agree with the one that I'm going to say. So, put your thumb up. If um, if you think he uh, if you think Alexander Graham Bell is Scottish, oh, quite a lot. That's interesting. Ooh, many. Put your thumbs up if you think he's uh, American. What if you are holding out there? No, it's only a couple that are. A few of you, maybe three. And what about finally put your thumbs up if you think he's Canadian? There's one. Just one. Arguably, you could all you could all, you're all sort of correct. Okay. So I certainly grew up thinking that Alexander Graham Bell was Scottish, but then I met a Canadian who said Alexander Graham Bell's Canadian. Uh, and then I met an American who claimed that Alexander Graham Bell was, was American. So the, the history of Alexander Graham Bell is he grew up in Scotland and emigrated to Canada and when he was about 18, I think it was. Uh, so he is a product of the Scottish education system is what, what I now frame it as. Um, but he does a, did a lot of his inventions and he submitted his patent for the telephone in, in the US. And the Bell Company, I think, was, a, was an American company. And he was also one of the, the people who helped found the National Geographic Society. So he certainly had a very significant role in this, but he... Um, I believe he's, he's, most of his life he was a Canadian citizen. Um, and I tell that story a, a lot simply because you should always be aware of the, the, the stories that you get told when you, when you grow up, um, that sometimes they have an element of truth in them and sometimes they've been, they've been flavored in a particular way. It's like the invention of the television um, where John Logie Baird, another um, Scot, in Scotland, we were brought up to think that John Logie Baird invented the television. Um, but if you go to the Museum of American History in Washington, D.C., it will have a big section on the American person that invented television. Uh, and there's also a Russian that claims to invent television. And very often, any of these technologies are a combination of lots of people doing small steps. The key thing that Alexander Graham Bell is, is in history is because he got to the patent office first. And he recorded the first patent for the for the. Um, but rarely is an invention a, uh, a product of a single single person. Now, why is Alexander Graham Bell significant for radar? Well, the key reason is that a lot of the early development of electrical engineering, that is the, the basis of what we do in radar, 
uh, is rooted in the history of telephony. So it's to do with building telephones and communication systems and tr transmitting waves across the Atlantic is that uh, the technology and the history of radar is, is very much rooted in, the, in that context. And one of the things that we find as a consequence of that, that we can't escape from is that we, you'll find that radar people use decibels a lot. Um, now decibels is not a unit, decibel, a decibel is a scaling factor. So it allows you to scale the, uh, the quantity of interest. You can, you're scaling it ref, with reference to a reference quantity, but you can always make that reference quantity equal to one. And therefore it's the, the logarithm to the base 10 of the number that you're interested in times 10. I've never managed to, to determine why it's a decibel because um, the deci bit comes from the factor of 10. So log to the base 10 of the subject, that, the value that you're interested in is a bell and it's a decibel because it's got a 10 in front of it. And this is used very often in the, in the way that we scale data and we look at data in our, in our radar context. And the bell, the unit of a, um, a bell is, is named after Alexander Graham Bell. So, as an aside, if you want to have a, because um, we'll take a, a short comfort break on the hour, uh, go, and, go and write down a list of SI units. And you'll find that the, some of them are capitalized and some of them are not capitalized. The difference between the two is that uh, capitalized units tend to be named after somebody. So Watts, for example, is a capital W and it's named after James Watt. A Bell is a capital B because it's named after Alexander Graham Bell. In terms of logarithms, we'll look at that in the, the sort of the, the some of those those core topics that we we have to get to grips with. Now, the idea of um, round about the same time is that there was some development in what was uh, a fairly basic idea of echolocation is that. One of the ways in which a ship, ships crossing the North Atlantic would look out for icebergs is that you just make a loud noise like a foghorn or you, um, you have some, some way of generating a loud noise. If you're out in the North Atlantic and you get an echo back, then it's either another ship, but you would hope that other ship had lights on so that you would be able to uh, see it as another ship. And this is in the dark we're talking about here. Um, if it's not another ship, it's probably an iceberg. And so that's a fairly, basic intro to, to the, the use of echolocation. So the idea that you're trying to pick up, um, pick up the echo of a, of a signal and that's the, the, uh, the basis of your measurement. You can measure the loudness of the echo might give you some indication of, of how large it is. Um, and the time it takes for the echo to come back, you, you know roughly the speed of sound. Um, so you can make a rough estimate for how far away that of that object is and you can take some action to steer away from it and that idea of echolocation was was well established before we come to the invention of radar and in fact uh, this person um, so Marconi Marconi famous for being the first um, person to transmit a radio signal across the Atlantic is that he also came up with an idea of the same principle of echolocation but instead of using uh, sound waves he used the, these new radio waves that they were using to transmit communication signals. So his, his proposal round about the turn of the century, so around about 1900, was that, well, we could send out one of these radio signals and it would bounce off a ship and then we could detect the signal coming back and we'd be able to tell how far away ships are from, from port, from harbour. So you would send out a signal and you would get echoes back from these ships. Now, one of, the, one of the challenges here and the way that I've drawn this animation is you can't tell the direction to these ships. All you can tell is how far away they are. So you can determine the distance to your target, but you can't tell which direction it's coming in. And this is the fundamental difference of radar remote sensing compared to optical remote sensing. Optical remote sensing uses angles. It measures the direction really, really well but it doesn't measure range very well. It doesn't, it has an ambiguity of range. You can use stereo by using two systems together, but one optical system on its own can't measure range. Angles, definitely yes, <clears throat> but not range. 
Radar, on the other hand, is fantastically good at doing range, but can't measure angles. So it can it can get uh, in terms of this animation, it can get these ranges very accurately, but it can't tell the difference between the top ship and the bottom ship because they're coming at different angles. Now we won't have time to delve into it uh, uh, in this course, but that's the basis of what we do with radar interferometry is that we actually start to use the phase information to help us determine the angles of the, the signals coming back as well as the range. And so if you have a direction and a range, you can locate things in their, their proper location. Now the other historic or, or historic patent in the history of radar comes in the 1930s. Um, and you'll notice that, that, that none of this technology so far has anything to do with cameras or photographic film. It's not, it's not a requirement for, for doing radar at all. Um, but this chap, Robert Watson Watt, was in the 30s, was actually asked if he could develop a death ray. People like Tesla were also looking at death rays in, in the 30s, but the, uh, Robert Watson Watt was asked if he could develop a death ray to, to uh, basically destroy enemy aircraft flying over the United Kingdom. And his calculations essentially came back and said, well, we're not going to be able to not, it just won't be able to put enough energy into that beam to knock it out of the sky. But what you will be able to do is to pick up the echo coming back. So you'll be able to determine where those aircraft are. Um, and you'll have an early warning system. Because again, before that, the, the best early warning systems involved listening out for, um, for the sound of uh, the engines of aircraft. And so the first civilian patent that was um, put in for an operating radar system in the way that we understand radar today was, was Robert Watson Watt's patent. Now, what happened next is that that was just leading into the Second World War. In fact, lots of other countries were developing radar, but everybody was doing it in secret. So nobody was submitting patents. Nobody was telling anybody else. And it's quite difficult, therefore, to track all the other developments in the, in the 30s. But the um, the Americans, the Germans, the Japanese were all developing uh, radar systems, much like the British were in the in the thirties. And that's where there was a real explosion in, in um, perhaps that's not the right words. There was a real growth in the use of uh, of the microwave part of the spectrum during the Second World War. They were using it for improving the quality and the ability to transmit large amounts of information and communicate. They were looking at things like death rays, even though they didn't necessarily work, but they were investigating them. You could definitely detect ships. So in fact, my um, one of the things I, I actually learned quite recently was that my, my grandfather on my mother's side actually flew on, uh, on ships out of West Africa during Second World War looking for submarine periscopes because the radar system would pick up the periscopes of the submarines in the North Sea. So they were very good at picking up ships and certainly very good at detecting aircraft. There's lots of uh, interesting anecdotes and stories about what happened during the Second World War to do with the detection and development of radar. And it was all being done in top secret. And that's, that's significant for a number of reasons. One is that uh, it was 20 years later before, um, in fact, 25 years later before there was any civilian use of radar systems. Um, but we'll also see it had an impact on the, the language that we use. The key thing is it was very, very successful. There was lots of activity. Uh, lots of people were working on these technologies during the, the Second World War. Um, another thing, oh, this, it came up in my diary today that it was Hedy Lamarr's birthday. Um, Hedy Lamarr was uh, an actress, Hollywood actress in the 30s and 40s who, who also during the Second World War invented what's called frequency hopping. So the reason that if we were physically in the same room just now, the reason that we could all take out our mobile phones and, and have a conversation with somebody at the same time, so not each other, but other people, um, is because of frequency hopping. And, and the type of coding that is used in frequency hopping is also used when we, uh, we try to improve the quality of imaging radar systems. So that's just a, a little nod to Hedy Lamar. Now, what happened after the, uh, after the war? One of the key things about um, post Second World War was that the need for all of these radar engineers dropped significantly. A lot of them essentially were made unemployed. And so a lot of them took the technology that they understood 
and they went to create new topics. They went to universities or other um, departments of the, of the government. And one of the key things that they did was develop radio astronomy. So the George Roll Bank in the background here was a consequence of um, Sir Bernard Lovell. But Bernard Lovell's background in radar is that he was one of the first people to propose putting a radar system, instead of having the radar system on the ground looking for aircraft, he was the first person to suggest, well, putting the radar on the aircraft to look at the ground. Now, I also use this, this point here in, this, in the story just to um, remind everybody that is, it's the same with all types of remote sensing that you cannot, you cannot um, separate out the, the historical development of the topic of remote sensing from, from military surveillance and, the, uh, and, and military activity in general. And that is, that's not, um, we, we can discuss at some point later about the pros and cons of that. The reality is that that is that is the development of the history, um, and I'm I'm not making any judgments on whether that that these things were right or wrong or how they were used, and and that comes up in particular because the um, the fairly devastating bombing raids over Europe by the Allies was was made possible because of the airborne radar system that Bernard Lovell developed, so that it actually allowed them to fly above cloud cover and fly at night and still be able to successfully navigate to their target. But that is where airborne radar and, air, and airborne imaging radar um, essentially originates. But so does the whole branch of radio astronomy, because many of these radar engineers went to become uh, astronomers and used their technology to do other things like bounce signals off of Venus from Earth or looking at the distant um, galaxies to help determine the size and the age of the, the universe. So it's... Um, and in fact, the background, the microwave background radiation was first detected by some radar engineers who couldn't work out where this extra little bit of noise was coming from. Now, all this was happening in secret until 1967. So that was the point at which the, um, there was the first civilian release of imaging radar. And it was in the Darien province in Panama, where cloud, consistent cloud cover had meant that they'd never been able to map inland using aerial photography. And so this was the first time that they'd had an extensive um, mapping campaign into the, this part of Panama. But what it did was it, it released um, imaging radar into the public domain. Now, one of the other consequences about all this develop, you know, the a very long multi-decadal development of radar in the, um, in the secrecy of the military context was that we have inherited the, the labeling that was developed during the Second World War. So whether you're looking at the frequency range or the wavelength range here, these are the, the radar bands that we refer to. Now I've, I've lumped together all the K bands because uh, typically for the types of remote sensing we're doing in this, uh, in this course, we don't typically use the K bands, but we will look at X, C, S, L, and P data. X band, for example, is what the uh, a lot of the new commercial companies like Capella, Space, and ISI are doing what it's what TerraSRX and the, the DLR group in Germany have had lots of success using X band. C band is typically the one that the Europeans and the Canadians like a lot. So RadarSat is C band, ERS 1 and 2, and NVSAT, and now Sentinel 1 are all C band. It's had a, a long history in terms of having very good applications in, in oceans and ice, which is why the Europeans and the Canadians went down that route. Um, S-band, there is an S-band SAR now. The Nova SAR, um, that is a UK SAR system, is is now available. It's a bit harder to get access to data, but it's not impossible. But that is um, that's an S-band SAR. An L-band. Those of you interested in forests in particular, L-band is the one that we tend to go to um, as our wave band of choice in order to uh, look at vegetation because it has some penetration through the the upper layers of the vegetation canopy. And P-band, there is a mission, the biomass mission will fly a P-band system for the first time in space. And that will completely revolutionize many of the ways in which we use radar to look at the Earth's surface. But these labels, and we'll look at these, how, how we use these wavelengths to look at the Earth's surface on Wednesday. But these labels, the X, C, S, L, P, and the K, they were purposefully chosen to have no order to them. So they were purposefully random because they were developed during the Second World War. 
and they didn't want to make it easy for any spies who had access to any of the information to try to see the consistency in what they were looking at. So we have inherited a labeling system which is purposefully uh, has no order to it. And that's one of the consequences of the, the secret development of, of radar. And we just have to learn it, unfortunately. Um, I've not yet come up with a nice um, a way of remembering it, but um, if anybody has one, do you let me know. But inevitably, you just have to now uh, learn how to remember that. Now, what, um, what I'm going to suggest is that we just take a, a small comfort break, not least of all because that means it just gives my voice a rest and it gives me a chance to catch up if there's been any questions being typed into the, the chat. So I'm going to come out with the sharing. What I'm going to do, I'm And I'll answer that question about phase um, shortly. So one, one of the things that I like to um, make sure people are aware of is that the electromagnetic spectrum is a, is a limited natural resource. So down this end at the, the microwave region, when you're actively transmitting things, um, is that in fact I'll get you let me uh, let me come out for you I'm going to go into the chat I'm going to ask I'm going to ask you to type into the chat as many things as you can think of that use that are in the microwave or radio part of the spectrum okay so what else so radar systems use use the microwave and radio part of the spectrum but what else uses the that part of the spectrum so if you've got an example put it into the chat Okay, microwave ovens, Bluetooth, mobile phones. You all put question marks for some reason. Which part of the internet, Neil, in particular? Oh, ultrasound. Ultrasound is, is not microwaves there, that's sound waves. But, but an ultrasound um, system and the way that you measure with sonar, all the same principles apply, except for polarization, but pretty much everything is the is the same in terms of what we do. But radio stations, Wi-Fi, um, MRIs, it's maybe slightly different. X-ray scanners, is that in the microwave part of the spectrum, Jonathan, or is that in the X-ray part of the spectrum? GPS, yes, very good. Television, um, the radio astronomers are trying to use that part of the electromagnetic spectrum is that there is um well let's just have a quick look who else is sharing so this part of the spectrum down here where the atmosphere has almost no impact and things like clouds don't have any impact Lots of people are trying to use that. It's a great place to transmit information. And if you take the this part of the, the spectrum down here that I just highlighted down to the microwave, if we if we shrink that down so that we're looking at just this part, this is the radio spectrum down here. Now, this diagram, um, which comes from the US Department of Commerce, is the allocation for all the, the frequencies in the radio spectrum. So each color that you see here is a different use case for that part of the electromagnetic, like electromagnetic spectrum. And what we're seeing in terms of if you go down each of these, if you go down each of these lines here, they, they are added together. So 30, 30 giga, gigahertz down here starts again up there. So essentially you have to stitch these all together. So from end here to end, from that end round to that end, from that end round to that end. So you have to imagine adding these all together and they fit down down the bottom here that's that section and the bit that we're interested in uh, is comparatively small it's down this bit in terms of the microwaves 
So let's zoom in, take a closer look. So you can see some of the things. Now this, uh, this sort of, there's a yellow, there's a yellow there, but there's a brighter yellow here. The slightly darker yellow is the radio location. So that's, that's our, these, the brighter, slightly brighter yellow is the radio astronomers. And the radio astronomers really want to make sure that there is absolute silence in those, um, uh, in those particular frequency ranges. So you'll see that in the radio astronomy band, this, this one here in the middle, it's actually Earth exploration satellites, passive, and space research, passive. So actually each of those three allocation uses here are all systems that are just listening. So in that particular band of frequencies, nobody is allowed to transmit any microwaves. Remember that radio astronomy is trying to be so sensitive that it is trying to pick up something of the energy of a light bulb at the distance of Saturn, right? It's very, very low signals that they are trying to pick up. So they can't afford to have any stray signals at all. So some of these bands here like that and all this radio astronomy stuff here, we can't use that for, for a radar. Um, the ones that are allocated for mobile, that's the um, mobile satellites. There's, there'll be um, satellite television will be in here somewhere. There'll be mobile phones are in here. There's GPS that will be in here. There's space research. Um, there's, uh, what else have we got? Aerial radio navigation. So there is a huge um, number of users of the electromagnetic spectrum. And the radio bands, the bands that we can use for radio location are well defined. So these bands that we that we get to use have a fairly limited scope. We can't just use any wavelength across the entire microwave part of the spectrum. That is going to be particularly problematic when you look at some systems. So the biomass mission, for example, and one of the things we'll look at next week when we look at some real data, um, we'll see some of the interference that we get from some of these signals. Because it may be that in the radio location that we are we happen to pick up stray signals from other things, some of some of which are never actually declared. Okay. And they are typically military installations that are using some kind of surface to air radar system. And uh, they don't always tell the International Tele um, Telecommunications Union that they've actually got it and at what wavelength they're transmitting it. So it is uh, it is a very busy space in terms of this part of the electromagnetic spectrum. It's not quiet. It's got, um, and that potentially introduces uh, challenges for us in terms of the, the limit to where in the spectrum that we can measure. Now let's have a quick look at one of the, so just broadly to get you interested, some of you already know what SAR can do, but I'm going to quiz through some really particularly nice examples. So we can see through the clouds. That's fantastic. Make, means that we get coverage. Um, those of you interested in, in planetary exploration, a place like Venus is perfect example of what you can do with radar because the Magellan probe actually went to Venus with a radar to see through the clouds because we couldn't actually, you can't see through them in the visible part of the spectrum. But this is the, the result from the radar analysis from the uh, NASA's Magellan spacecraft. And the quality of data coming back from the Magellan spacecraft was fantastic. And you cannot get that quality of data anywhere in the visible or near infrared part of the spectrum because the cloud cover, the very dense carbon dioxide atmosphere is just uh, so thick you can't see through it. Now that was, um, I showed you the Darien province, that was the start of the early year radar remote sensing. And um, about 10 years after that, there was a launch of CSAT. CSAT was the first civilian spaceborne radar system. The space shuttle in the 80s, three times took up an imaging radar. In the 90s, the Europeans and the Japanese launched um, the ERS and the JERS satellites with radar. In the 2000s, we had Envisat, ALOS, RadarSat, Terrasar, Cosmos SkyMed. Into the 2010s, we're now looking at Sentinel-1, which is the first time we've had regular and committed ongoing radar data. We've got continued ALOS and RadarSat-2, Argentinian SOCOM, uh, Finland has 
as the new commercial company flying very small, low cost radars with ISI. And there's many, many more. And this was one of the first images from ERS, falsely colored, of the uh, Frisian Islands at the north of the Netherlands. Uh, and this here is one of the uh, a more recent image from the Sentinel-1. So the, so the image quality is much better, but there's also lots more going on. See, the, that's the difference of, what would that be, 30 years. Um, the North Sea now has many wind farms. These little dots and the structures up in the North Sea here are, are wind farms. And one of the things that we might do next week on the practical is, is looking at time series where you can actually see these wind farms being, uh, being constructed. But one of the key things to pick out here is that even over the water surface, there, is, there are features and variation that is, um, corresponds only to the surface roughness. The microwaves don't see any of the properties of the water. They're always going to scatter off just the surface of the water. So these variations across the water surface is, is just due to roughness. And when you get down near the coast, you can see there's even more variation. And so we will pick up on that on Wednesday when we look at, well, what is that telling us? Why, why does radar picking up is sensitive to surface roughness? And what does that mean for us when we look at the land surface? Um, somebody had asked about looking at ships. So these little points here are, are something that we'll, we'll also consider um, what might we, we do in terms of looking at ships in the sea and why do they come out so bright? We'll look at that on, on Thursday. But we can get increasingly high quality down to about three meter spatial resolution from some of the radar satellites now in space. This is the, the pyramids in Cheops. And I show this because you'll, if you look closely, there seems to be weird stuff going on here with the, the pyramid. It doesn't look like a plan view that you would expect of a pyramid. It seems to have some kind of strange overlapping effect on the, on the top. And that's, that's one of the strange consequences of the way that imaging radar um, makes that assumption about the ground surface being flat. And so it, 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 um, it skews some of the measurements that it, that it makes. I'm only going to, this is a, an image to do with altimetry, which I only mention in passing to just let you know that many of the things that we talk about in imaging radar, a lot of the same principles apply to altimetry. It's slightly different because the altimeter is looking straight down to the, uh, to the nadir point, the point directly below the satellite. Um, but it does manage to pick up its, um, you know, amazing changes down to a scale of centimeters over continental scales. So here, for example, is, um, is some work. Um, looking at cryostat, picking out the changes in elevation per year over almost the entire Antarctica. This area in the middle here, that's not the entrance to the underworld. That is just because there's no data collected right at the poles. A near polar orbit doesn't actually get over the poles. It goes close to the poles. But it gets almost full Antarctic um, coverage of, the, of changes in elevation on a scale of centimetres per year. But many of you are interested in vegetation and you should be very excited about the upcoming biomass mission. Um, that's the P-band, so a very long wavelength system that the European Space Agency is flying. Uh, they show nice graphs like this that make it look like the above ground biomass and the P-band backscatter are extremely well correlated. But I urge great caution when you interpret um, such graphs such as these because each of these points has actually been shifted vertically in order to, uh, because if you look at the original paper, what they're doing is representing the, they're trying to show that the trend is the same across all of these different forest types. And one of the things I'll talk about in particular on Wednesday is how do we interpret the, the return, the backscatter return over, uh, over forest and other types of vegetation. We'll look at that in more detail on Wednesday, but it is very topical because the biomass mission will, will bring us new data that will help in that context and also applying very interesting techniques such as polarimetric interferometry which seems to be much better at estimating the forest biomass rather than just using the intensity of the signal on its own still experimental but is part of the the core mission objectives within the biomass mission and especially in the in the tropics Interferometric SAR has been used to now produce many um, 
well, you've got a choice now of at least two different global data sets of elevation. Um, the SRTM data, which is now available at 30 meters, is available for the entire planet. The um, although right at the very high latitudes, um, it doesn't. It, it's filled in by other data. Um, but the Tandem X mission has been, it's, which is a, a using interferometry from two satellites that are flying in parallel to each other. That's a commercial product, which you can get some examples of for looking at uh, experimental things. But if you want it operationally, you have to pay for it. And interferometry has been used now very regularly, and it is, is a consistent part of geophysics now for looking at ground motion. And one of the, the examples, this is now quite an old example, but I still I still love it because it gives a, a, a nice representation of what radar is, is capable of measuring. Now, there was a question, I don't remember who it was that asked the question about the phase of this wave and whether or not they, you just measure the phase or the phase difference. Now, the, the key thing is that um, in terms of the radar system, what it's measuring for each pixel is the actual wave and it, it measures the amplitude and the phase at which it arrives at the system. And that's why it's very difficult with one image to do anything with it. But when you start looking at phase differences, <clears throat> if you can measure the phase difference over, and this is a, uh, an image over London, if you can measure phase differences on the scale of the wavelength and you're looking at wavelengths of maybe only five centimeters, uh, you can start to make very, very small measurements of the of, of the, the distance between the satellite system and the, the object you're looking at. So in this image here, the scale goes from, and, and it's very clear there are some geographic features going on here. There's some areas of blue and areas of red, but the extremities of this scale are going from minus four millimeters a year to plus four millimeters a year. So this is measured over a period of about 10 years, I think it is. And it is uh, the entire scale is about that distance between my fingers, barely a centimeter. The explanation for what's happening here is that it's certainly been claimed that some of these red lines on the western part of London are actually picking up an extension to the underground line. Because remember, this is only four millimeters a year. So it's only that much. It's it's not as it, it is within you know the tolerances you might expect if you tunnel underneath a city. And this blue area here is often explained by the fact that this is in the uh, the Docklands area where the um, the industries that used to be there often it, were extracting groundwater to make do things like making paper. But they've all gone now. It's all office blocks and um, fancy apartments. And so the, the groundwater is now uh, eventually coming back. And so the ground is actually rising. It's only, what, one or two millimeters a year, so not very fast. But the radar system is able to, to pick that up. And that's because we're measuring the phase and the amplitude. And these tiny phase differences of the waves can be detected. And in terms of the prospect, it is a, an amazingly exciting time to be in, in radar remote sensing. Uh, the Novasar and the Sentinel-1, for example, are up and, and running. ISI and Capella have got their first satellites. Capella are looking to get 36 satellites up in orbit, ISI 18. So just about nowhere on planet Earth will not be observable by a radar system every few hours, is the, that's the ambition. The RadarSat constellation is a collection of three satellites. The Argentinian SOCOM is two satellites. One of those is already launched. Um, NISAR is a collaboration between India and NASA. And that's, that's an L-band satellite. The Tandem L is a DLR um, satellite that's in planning. And the Biomass mission is a European Space Agency one. So these, these ones at the top are going to generate data like we've never seen before. The rest of them are going to collect, collect data more frequently than we've ever seen before. Right, let's look at the, the properties of these waves. So what I've been saying is that the, the key thing is that we measure in our pixel the actual properties of the wave. So let's skim through. And some of you have, who remember their high school physics um, or, or even more physics that you might have done, uh, this might be just simple revision for you. For others, it might be relatively new, but I, I want to just go through it quite quickly so that you've you've got it in your head a little bit about the properties of waves and what we're measuring. 
But electromagnetic radiation, it's a time varying, so it's oscillating electric field and magnetic fields. Um, and the technicality of that is that the because they induce each other, it means that that electromagnetic waves can can keep propagating through space. So even if there's no medium, it doesn't need a medium to actually uh, transmit through. What it's the wave is actually self-propagating, and that's how it travels through a, a vacuum. So you don't actually need, need any matter. Now. What I've said here is that such oscillating phenomena has the properties of a wave. And what I mean by that is um, I cannot tell you what the exact um, nature of electromagnetic radiation is. What we have are models and explanations that help us understand what electromagnetic radiation is. And we might go on a different path and want to talk about photons. But in a radar context, for us, we can talk about this oscillating phenomena as a wave, and it works just fine. Now, it has wave-like properties and a sinusoidal function or a cosinusoidal function also has those same types of properties. So for mathematical simplicity, we're just going to use the sinusoidal function as a way to describe the uh, R wave. And a wave like this has an amplitude A, and you'll notice that the amplitude is from the, the Z axis to the, the total height. It's not from maximum to minimum. The fact that we use a Z axis here, not the X axis, is because later on, um, when we look at polarization, I want to look at this plane and I want to have the X axis coming out of the screen. So I've got an X and a Y here and the Z in the direction of travel. So don't be upset by the fact that I've not used X and Y, I've used Z and Y. It's, it's all the same, it's still just two Cartesian coordinates. The wavelength is the distance over which it repeats itself. And we're going to use a sine function. A the difference between a sine function is a and a cosine function is that the uh, the phase of the wave, so the stage that the wave is at, is, is different. But the shape of the function is the same. Sine function is just slightly easier because it starts at 0, 0. You'll also notice that I've done this instead of 0 to 360 degrees, I've done this in radians. So 0 to pi to 2 pi. We'll talk about it. Um, in fact, I'll do that. But the looks of the timing, I'll do that at the beginning of Wednesday's lecture. So we have a function that looks like this, but it's very static. It's, it's what we call our wave function. We've got our amplitude. We've got the sine function that goes from a minimum of minus one and a maximum of one. We've got the direction of propagation, which is our Z. <clears throat> We've got some constant, which we call the wave number. And we're going to use units of radians because they're mathematically um, easier to use than the arbitrary 360 degrees. So this equation describes a, a wave along the z direction, but it doesn't that doesn't have time in it yet. So we actually have to modify that equation so we incorporate an extra um, v times t. So that's the speed of the wave. That's the speed of the wave. Um, times the time it takes after some time. And the importance there is, you don't have to remember this equation, but I want to just stress the fact that we, we're not just looking at static waves, we're looking at waves that travel in time. So if you, if you hold the clock, it will have a wave shape, but if you stay in one place and run the time, it will also, you will, you will get an oscillating phenomenon. And I've got a nice graphic that's going to help ex explain what's going on there. And you can rearrange these in terms of what the constants are. And we, we also get our unit of frequency. So the unit of frequency is a hertz shortened to HZ. So another capitalized unit there. And that is in units of per second. Now, let me show you this, this, little, this little diagram is a classic di diagram that um, is very difficult to understand if it's static and much easier to understand if it's animated. So I'm going to animate that in a second. But what I wanted to show you here is that <clears throat> if you do your trigonometry, and I was doing this just with my son last night with his maths homework, is that if we've got our angle, in this case phi, is that the sine function of phi is equal to the opposite, 
which is the length of this vector as I've drawn it here. So that's the amplitude A. So it's the opposite. Um, oh, I've got that around the wrong way. Hold on a second. Just rub that out. Sine of phi is equal to our opposite, which is the, the height here. So it's our, our component. So it's the height of the wave at any given time. It's the it's the the, the component on the what I've called the b-axis here. So it's b, this bit here. Divided by our hypotenuse, which is the amplitude A. So the, the Y component or the B component here is equal to, we can get rid of that. It's A times sine theta, which is a pro or sine phi, which is approximately the function that we had already established for the shape of our wave. Now, what's the significance of this? This looks rather complicated. What I'm trying to do is to show you that instead of drawing waves, we can instead, we can draw vectors. Okay, so this vector here can represent a particular wave. So this vector represents this wave. And I can color code them. This vector, on the other hand, corresponds to this wave. And last but not least, this vector here corresponds to this wave. Let me show you the animation. The animation will make it, I hope, infinitely clear. Whoops, if I can get that right. So what you're seeing here is that the we're plotting the y-axis component along this line and we're rotating this vector. So as this vector goes round and round this circle, it maps out an oscillating function that goes up and down these this axis here. So it goes up. And what it's doing is it's just oscillating back and forth and creating this wave shape. Now I introduce you to this idea because what it means is that any we don't have to, we don't have to draw waves anymore. Waves at different phases can be represented just by the length of this vector. And we can have different vectors pointing in different directions that represent the different phases and the length of the vector represents the amplitude of our wave. Now the speed by which the wave is traveling, well, all our waves travel at the same speed. They're all traveling at the speed of light. So actually we don't even have to rotate these vectors anymore. What we can do is just represent, instead of drawing any waves, we're gonna represent each of our waves with a vector. And each vector has an amplitude and a phase angle. And these vectors have all been all been drawn as if they're, they're, they're all the same length, but they don't need to be. So each of these vectors here that I'm drawing They each have a different amplitude and they have a different angle from the, so each of them, you can measure a different angle for each of them. And they represent different waves all at different phases. And one of the, the things is that we can now use that later on that when we're, we're talking about adding together, for example, we can just add these vectors. We don't have to draw lots of waves and try to add them. And it's a convenient way to, to um, think about what those waves are. But more than that, it also helps to show what each of what our pixel of each of our radar system is actually measuring is that for each pixel, we've got an amplitude and a phase measure. So essentially each pixel is a vector. If you remember that image I showed right at the beginning, it had the two numbers for each pixel. Well, those two numbers can be a, an X coordinate and a Y coordinate, or they can be an amplitude and an angle, so a, a direction and a, a length. So it's polar coordinates versus Cartesian coordinates. And what you'll find if you start looking at SNAP next week is that you can actually look at, at these two channels um, in these co co 
Cartesian coordinates, or you can look at the amplitude and the phase angle. You can look at them either way. So that's the key thing about the phase and the way that just for completeness, because you'll get a copy of these um, these slides, I think is what we're going to do is that they, to completely finish the story about the description of the wave, we've got how it changes in space, how it changes in time, and how what stage the wave was at before it um, before it started, and that's that extra phase term. And just to show you the animation of what that means in terms of having two different waves, is that these two vectors now, as a static wave, so I can let it play for a bit, but um, that's our phase difference between those two waves. So we've got a way to represent waves by just two numbers and, and visually represent it as a, as a vector. And that's our final wave description. So in terms of, we've got, pro so individual waves, it's traveling at a certain speed. So the speed of light, it's got a wavelength, which for us is in millimeters to meters. It's got a period or a frequency, which is in hundreds of megahertz to um, tens of gigahertz. It has to have a starting phase so that we know um, where, where it begins, what cycle the wave is in. And then the other thing that we need to think about, which we'll look at in a second, is the polarization. So what, how is the wave oriented? Is it oriented vertically or horizontally? But just for completeness, I wanted to introduce you to the, the concept of the combination of waves. So if we've got two waves, so if we've got these two waves that com combine together, and they may combine together because there's, there's two scatterers on the ground and you've got two waves coming back together and they arrive at the antenna at the same time. Is that in this first case here, these two waves are arriving, they are what's referred to as being in phase. So it means they, they look like that and they will combine together to make one larger wave. If on the other hand, they come back out of phase. So what I mean by that is that one is, um, a full half half a, a cycle out, so 180 degrees or pi radians out of phase, is that where there is a peak of one, there is the trough of the other. They cancel each other out and you end up with, with no signal at all. You can also get the in-between cases. So that's the two extremes on the left and right there, where, where one you get twice the amplitude and the other one you get zero. But you can mix and match any combination of different amplitudes and phases in order to, to end up with a, a wave which is somewhere in between these two extremes. And this is one way in which you should think about why you get speckle, is that when you get scattering from the Earth's surface, occasionally, because you've got lots of scatterers within a pixel, is that occasionally these waves will come combine together and there'll be more than two, there'll be uh, you know thousands within a pixel is that when they combine together in constructive ways, they can give a very bright signal. Um, but very often they're combining against each other in such a way that they cancel each other out. And often it's somewhere in between, but you can get variation across all these extremes. And that's why a radar image starts to look uh, speckly because you have all these different waves coming back from the surface and they're combining together in, in different ways. <coughs> and that's problematic because they're combining together, not because, because you notice that these waves all have the same amplitude. So the average energy that we're looking for um, is, isn't represented in the final, the final uh, measurement. So one of the things that we have to do is to find a way to average over lots of different measurements. So it kind of cancels out this or evens out the impact of the phase signal. And we end up getting a, a good average of the the average wave that's coming back from our, our surface. The other way that it, this is significant is because when we look at things like antenna patterns or the time of type of scattering that comes from a surface, we can also represent it by a combination of lots of individual waves. And there's a little animation here that hopefully works across Zoom, but the 
these are two little transmitters. So these two circles on the left here are transmitting a wave. So the light band is the peak and the dark band is a trough. And you'll notice that these two um, systems here are generating rings of waves. And some of you might even remember the days in uh, high school physics where you had what was called a water tank, where you actually had a tray of water that would go on the overhead projector and they had little vibrating balls or, or lines that would vibrate to create the waves. And then on the overhead projector, you would see these wave patterns. I don't know if anybody's anybody's going to admit to having seen that at school. Put your thumb up if you're if you've ever actually seen a water tank at um, school. Oh, there's a few people. Ah, more than I expected. I can't believe you're all you're all old enough to have remembered wave tanks. I'm not sure. Did they, they maybe still do them in school? I don't know. But that's this is the digital equivalent of the wave tank, and what we're looking at here is the waves, and you'll see that the that this pattern of peaks and troughs. Because the trough in this zone here, the, 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 the minima here where there is no wave pattern is because the distance that it's traveled from one to the other transmitter is that it's just the right change in difference that the two waves are now out of phase and they cancel each other out. Down the center here, it's always by symmetry, it's always the same distance. So down the center line, it's always the same distance from this one and that one is always going to be the same distance. So the waves always arrive, they're always in phase and they're always combining together to give a peak. But you'll notice there are other places where there are peaks and other places where there are troughs. And one of the things that I want to just um, emphasize here is that there's lots more we can explore. There's, there's lots of stuff. I've got lots of these kinds of animations that help to explain many of the things that are going on that are to do with the microwave scattering off the surface and how speckle is generated and, and how we do radar interferometry. Um, and all I want you to, to realize, if, not, if you take nothing else away, is to think, wow, this is really complicated and nothing like I thought a, how a camera works. And that's good because I want part of the reason I show these animations and these vector waves and everything else is a, is a <clears throat> is reframing the way in which you're understanding radar remote sensing and starting to realize that actually it's not just taking a picture with microwaves. It's something quite um, quite elaborately diff different because we are using these monochromatic waves that we've got control over. They're all the same frequency, the same wavelength. We're sending them out and then they all start to interact with each other and it starts to become quite um, both beautiful and chaotic in equal measure. Now, let me look a, a little bit more about polarization. Okay, so this is, and, and the key the key here is this, this is my wave. And if it's been transmitted to you, what I'm interested in is what's going on in, in the plane of my antenna. Okay, and the, the, the basic idea of polarization is that you've, or the polarization that we'll mostly be, um, get involved with in a Sentinel-1 data context is either vertical or horizontal waves. We can transmit and receive uh, in any radar system, vertical and horizontal waves. But typically in order to reduce costs and to maximize how many pulses that we can send out, because that's a key feature when we, um, when you're trying to build a, a, a an image in imaging radar, is that most of the regular data collected by satellite radar will only transmit one polarization. So Sentinel One, for most of the land surfaces, only transmits vertical, and then listens for vertical coming back, vertical echoes, but it also listens for horizontal echoes coming back because listening and picking up passively the echoes coming back, that doesn't take any extra energy. It doesn't um, waste uh, valuable time in terms of transmitting extra pulses. It's the transmission which is the, is the problem part of that. In the very high latitudes, so any of you out there that's interested in the cryosphere, for example, the polar regions for Sentinel actually sends out horizontal, it transmits horizontal and it receives 
listens out for the horizontal coming back, but it also listens out for vertical coming back. And the, the nature of, of objects on the Earth's surface is that it, it changes the polarization. It can twist it or turn it and make the polarization slightly different. So you might transmit a vertical wave, but the object might actually end up returning something that is um, like that. So polarized at an angle, say 45 degrees. If it's at 45 degrees, it actually has a horizontal component that you would measure when you were looking just for horizontal. But if you're looking just for vertical, you would also pick up a bit of vertical motion there as well. And so it's um, there is features on the ground surface that will change the polarization. And that's why we detect the both the what's called the copole, so transmit one and receive that same polarization, or the cross pole, where you transmit one polarization and receive the other polarization. It's a whole nother two hour lecture to go into this sort of full aspect of polarimetry. So let's not do that, but um, let's just look a little bit more about uh, polarization. This is just another um, image sort of representing the, or showing you the difference between the vertical and horizontal polarization. Now, one of the ways that we can think of these little blue antennas here is that uh, that we can be trans that can be a transmitter, but it could also be a detector. So, in terms of what it is you're um, detecting, are you detecting the vertical or the or the horizontal? And in terms of um, <clears throat> oh yeah, I'm going to do a little uh, demonstration in a second just to get you interested in in polarization. One of the things about um, sticky tape. Does anybody anybody? So here's two questions, because there might be some amateur photographers out there that have a polarizing filter for their camera. So if you have a polarizing filter for your camera or you have some polarized sunglasses and you have them to hand, uh, put, your, put your thumb up. So Alison has got something, Alex, it's got a couple of people. Right, so this is, some, this is something you can try at home, okay? And all it involves is something that is some kind of polarizing filter. So for me, uh, I've got a set of these little linear polarizers. And what a linear polarizer is, is it's, it's like, it's, you can imagine it like a grid, okay? So it, my fingers are the grid that is only gonna allow through vertically polarized waves. So the vertically polarized waves get to come through my fingers, but ho horizontally oscillating, so horizontally polarized waves can't get through because they're, they're blocked. So that's that's one way to picture what your your polarized sunglasses or this polarizer is doing. Now, one thing I can show you is that if this is an iPad, now most um, most screens are actually polarized in some way. And if I open up, um, I'm just going to create a very large white screen. If I stand up, okay, and I'm going to show you this. Um, in fact, let me come out of this slide so that you can see it in, f in full glory. Right, hopefully you're just seeing me now. And this is a um, a screen. I'll turn this light off just for a second. And if I put this polarizing filter, you'll you should see that if I when I rotate it, I'll show you so you can see it rotating. Is as I rotate it, it goes darker. So the iPad screen goes darker as I rotate it. So it's bright. So the polarizing, that's the, the orientation of the polarization of the screen. And it goes dark when I ro rotate it so that it's not letting that light through. Now, what's interesting about sticky tape, okay? So just sellotape, sticky tape. That's, that is, it's, a, it's a real sort of hatchet job what I've done here because I did it very, very quickly. But what I've done, if you can see, is that I've just put lots of tape. I've made a little window of cardboard. I put lots of tape across it but in multiple random ways. Okay, so if you look closely, you can see that I've just created lots of 
overlapping bits of sellotape. Now, what's interesting about sellotape <clears throat> is that sellotape, as they as waves come through the sellotape, it actually twists the polarization. So if polarized waves come in one side, the sellotape actually twists it. And if you've got multiple layers of sellotape, it twists it some more, and a bit more, another bit of sellotape, it twists it again. But in proportion to the wavelength of the, uh, of the light. So what you're going to see is that as the, the light from the screen, which is approximately white, and this is polarized coming from the screen, so it's a certain polarization. It's going to go through the sellotape, and the sellotape, in proportion to the wavelength, is going to twist the polarization. So hopefully, what you see, why right, that looks really boring. Until let's hope this works. Until I put the polarizer up over here, and as I rotate it, you can see that all the colors change. And so what the final polarizing filter here, what that's doing is it's only allowing some of those polarizations through. And because it's twisting, it's twisting the light, all the different colors differently, that as it goes through the sellotape, the colors are being twisted differently. And eventually it's only the polarizations left that are going in one polarization that get to go through this final filter. So hopefully you can all see that. And I'll just try and rotate it so it all looks colorful and changes color. It's basically the remote sensing classes version of the lava lamp. So why do I want to show you that? Well, essentially, this is what we've got um, a single polarization coming out of here. So that's like our transmit polarization. It's interacting with some uh, material. And then our final uh, lens is is detecting the um, is is acting like the detector. So it's only detecting one polarization. And so if something as straightforward as sellotape is actually impacting on the polarization, we might expect that many other features of the Earth's surface might also impact the polarization. And indeed, we find that that is definitely the case. Agricultural fields, in particular, are very good at changing the polarization um, because you've got very organized and or well oriented objects in each agricultural field. Some of the signal comes straight off the vegetation. Some of it um, is absorbed by the vegetation as it goes through, and that can be in proportion to the different wavelengths. When it's interacting with vegetation, the vegetation may turn change and turn the, the, the polarization of the signal. Now, it doesn't look as colorful as that because we've typically only got um, one wavelength, so there's no color um, there's no wavelength dependence in terms of that scattering. Although you can look at multiple wavelength radar and that would generate a, a different, um, it would look very different. You would get m multiple colors then. And those of you, if there's any of you from a, a geological background, you'll have seen that, that methodology used for analyzing crystals, for example, because that tells you something about the, the properties of the, of the crystals. So the key thing is that you can that polarization that um, the the natural world um, can impact on the polarization. So there is potentially some value in looking at the difference between transmitting one polarization, receiving that polarization, or receiving other polarizations. Right, I've got a couple of slides just to finish on, and then there will be time for a, a few questions. What I wanted to show you in these last few slides was just to relate that back to the, the instrumentation. So what you can see um, here, this is the Sentinel-1. And the, the big blue panels at the top isn't the radar system. That's the solar panels that, that generate the power. At the bottom, that, pan, that flat panel at the bottom is the radar antenna. So that's doing all the transmission and all the receiving of the, of the signal. And this, there's some human beings down on the left here for scale. Um, but this is your, I can't remember exactly what it is, but it's over 10 meters long in terms of the antenna. So the Sentinel-1 antenna. And one of the, the 
the key things here about this antenna is it's actually made up of lots of small components. So each of these little components here, um, and I'm pretty sure I meant to check actually, but I'm fairly sure that these, you know, these components are the, your uh, vertical and horizontal um, detectors and receivers. So each of these is a transmit and receive module that can both transmit and receive signals related to the, the polarization. But the antenna pattern is actually, the antenna is physically made up of lots of tiny antennas, which each on their own is, is not very good. It's not very directional, doesn't um, have a lot of power. But if you combine many of them together into a big panel and then lots of panels together, you're able to generate um, sufficient power and sufficient sensitivity for the receiving signal that you can start to do um, synthetic aperture radar.